One of the two biggest names in RPG history is Dragon Quest, or if you were in North America for most of the series, Dragon Warrior. It was arguably the biggest series ever produced by Enix, you know, until they got eaten by Square, and they were also the biggest rival to Square's Final Fantasy series, the other biggest name in RPG history. And up until last week, I had never played one. And as a big RPG fan, I can honestly say I'm not proud of that. But with my acquisition of a Dragon Quest 1 and 2 Super Famicom cart, and my Retron 5's ability to patch English translations into everything, I fixed that problem. Now the story is this. Due to some baffling real estate decision, the king of the land has placed his castle, like, six map squares away from the main villain's castle. That must have been a smooth talking realtor, I'm just saying. But now the villainous Dragon King has kidnapped the princess and stolen the light from the land. Now you... No, not you. The guy in the back must take up your sword as the descendant of the legendary hero and save the world. Well, for the most part, that's the biggest focus, but there's actually a really cool subplot about your character proving that he is a hero. See, no one seems to recognize that you're actually the descendant of the legendary hero. So you have to go out and somehow prove to the world that you are, in fact, who you say you are, and that you are really as great as you say you are through your own actions, which is cool and thus create a legend that rivals your ancestor. And all goes well until a monster jumps out at you, going But then you're all like, Do you know who I am? I'm the descendant of the legendary hero. You can't stop this hype train. Chew, chew. And then you cut him in half while laughing evilly in your own internal monologue because you're secretly an evil hero who will take over the world once you defeat the current residing evil master that is the Dragon King. Or maybe that was the subplot I wrote in. Whatever. So the game itself is a fairly basic RPG. It follows a very old school clunky menu system, but there is a way to alleviate this, at least on the Super Famicom version. You can actually play this game with just your left hand, being able to direct your character with the control buttons and then substitute going through any menus whatsoever with the L shoulder button, which effectively doubles as talk, search, check, agree, whatever. It's definitely a very smooth system, and it helps to alleviate some of the stress of having to go through a ton of really super clunky menus. Now that doesn't completely alleviate some of the old-schoolness of this game, like having to constantly go out and buy magic keys to continue your exploration efforts, or buy torches so that you're not stuck in a cave in the dark, because that's no fun. But despite the sort of awkward inventory management that that forces upon you, it still works relatively well, because for the most part, you're never going to be caught without torches. You sort of always need them, despite there being so few locations in this game. And likewise, keys don't even really come into effect until the halfway mark of the game. And that leads to sort of a cool aspect about how this game works because this game is, for the most part, non-linear. Sure, you have an end goal of beat the final boss, and whatever, but the only thing that's really stopping you from exploring is enemy levels, and the overworld is wide and allows you to explore wherever you want, you know, provided you don't get yourself killed. You can go explore all the various different towns so long as you can handle the enemies, and you can go in whatever order you want, provided that you understand what you need to do. Leading into that non-linearity is how this game is structured in terms of objectives. There are all sorts of sub-objectives, such as finding the flute which you need to kill a boss all the way down the line, but you can get it very early on. But the thing is, in order to do this, you have to take adequate notes. This is an RPG, and like most RPGs, you kind of have to talk to everyone twice. But unlike a current RPG, which would then put an arrow on the other side of the map, you have to mentally remember it, or take down notes, as to where you need to go and what you need to do. And because of this, it adds a bunch of tiny sub-objectives that you have to go exploring for, but it's entirely at your own pace, which makes the pacing kind of brilliant. In addition, this game is constantly challenging its own conventions for exploration. In one example, in order to find a dungeon, you have to find a hidden passage. This hidden passage is located somewhere within the walls themselves, but you can't see them. So unless you already know to search one specific area of one specific room, you would never know that it's there. And stuff like that is just brilliant, because it's not withholding information from you at any point. You just have to be willing to search for it, 
and use your own initiative to figure out what it all means. And that makes it a very cerebral game in terms of exploration. One other mechanic worth noting is that the only way to save your game is to go back to the king all the way at the start of the game. Now, this is fairly archaic, and it does serve to more or less just artificially lengthen the gameplay. Because if you took this entire game as a linear adventure without having to make any stops to save, you could probably beat it in two hours, give or take. But the fact that you have to constantly go back to the main castle means that every single leg of this adventure becomes its own sort of mini quest. Even if it's something as small as going across a bridge to test the waters to see if you can handle the new enemies. Because while death isn't all that big a deal, you do have to travel all the way back, and you do lose half your money which in turn means that you're less prone to getting new armor, which means you're going to get crushed even more. This game encourages going out and exploring, but coming back and reporting your details to the king every step of the way. Likewise, next to your castle is the evil castle of the final boss. And while you can only get to it after you've done pretty much everything else in the game, it's constantly there taunting you just sort of looming there off in the distance, and it definitely makes each adventure feel a little more tense because you've got that stake of helping save the kingdom, but it's not about some invisible entity. You can see exactly where their home base is on the map, it's surrounded by a poison water and it's kind of ominous. And because of that, that just ramps up the stakes of the adventure all the same. I'm telling you, the guys who made this game, they knew what they were doing. Now combat is relatively simple, you walk around and then eventually encounter monsters. The encounter rate is fairly average, it's not overly high or overly low, which is good. And the monsters themselves tend to scale after each passing bridge, so you kind of have an idea of where you need to go if you want to fight something stronger. And where you can retreat to if you're getting your ass handed to you. But combat itself is simple, you just tell your character to attack the monster, you punch the monster until they can't get up anymore, or until you die. As you level, you eventually gain different spells which allow you to heal or hurt your opponent more, or even disrupt their own spells. And as simple as this is, it works well, and there's even more complexity to it when you bring into account certain enemies' scripted weaknesses. For example, the golem can only be affected by the flute. If you use it on him, he then becomes basically immobile and you can just wail on him till he dies. And those little strategic elements definitely make combat a lot more in-depth than you originally think it is. Now, so far I've been largely positive about the gameplay, and that's because it is good. There are two things that do bother me about gameplay here, although one of them is completely subjective to me. First and foremost is something of a problem, and that is that while enemies tend to scale well, the money they drop and the cost of equipment doesn't quite scale as properly. Once you get to the fourth or so town in the game, stuff starts costing way too much for the amount of money you make for killing the local enemies. They tried to alleviate this by having a single, rather tough to defeat enemy show up every once in a while that drops a stupid amount of money, but that just feels like a clumsy way to solve a problem that could have been better handled by having stuff cost slightly less, or to scale up the normal amount of money from normal enemies. Now the other problem I have with this game is simply the way combat is handled. I personally am not a big fan of the whole first person RPG combat. For whatever reason I've always enjoyed the Final Fantasy style where you can actually see your character punching the monster. So basically what I'm saying is for whatever reason, and I have no idea why, I enjoy my RPG combat to be less immersive, not more. But overall gameplay is solid. Now the overall presentation is pretty good. I mean, let's be honest, this is just an up Famicom game that fits the Super Famicom's palette. But that said, it still works for what it needs to do. Everything looks nice. Granted, there isn't a ton of variance in overworld tiles or anything. This game also features Akira Toriyama-tastic enemies that definitely look like they were just taken straight out of Dragon Ball, some of them. And they do look detailed and menacing in some cases, so well done. Tons of personality there. The audio design is also relatively well done. I'm a big fan of the overworld song, and the village themes are really soothing and nice. In the end, Dragon Quest is a well-known series for a reason. Because it had a really good start. And even all these years later, even with zero sense of nostalgia for this game, because I never played it, I can tell you, it's excellent. It definitely dates itself, but if you're capable of looking past that, and some people aren't, 
I'd say grab it, it's definitely a ton of fun. This game was of course released on the Famicom and NES, again as Dragon Warrior. There was the Super Famicom Dragon Quest 1 and 2 cartridge, which is what I'm playing this on, along with a fan translation so I can play it in English. And unfortunately, if you want to play this particular cart in English, there isn't a ton of options to do so. There was, however, a Game Boy Color cart of this, which was brought to North America, and I've actually been trying to get that one for years. And I think this game even got a release as part of the now long-defunct Satellaview satellite broadcasting subsystem for the Super Famicom, which probably would not have happened if this game wasn't excellent. Which it is. If you like RPGs and you haven't tried Dragon Quest, I'd say give this one a go. And I gotta say, while I've never played this series up till this point, I kinda wanna try and play the rest now. So good show, Dragon Quest. Good show.